Okay, so I think we'll get going. Uh, it's great to see at least images of people um, and great to see people here in the classroom. Um, that's awesome. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be uh, handling uh, a topic that could really fit in many places. It doesn't have a full module associated with it, but uh, I think it's uh, important and underappreciated and correspondingly under commented area of Asian based modeling. And that concerns the issue of multi scale, multi level, or hierarchical models. Um, and their ability to, to naturally capture, as it were, nested layers of hierarchy that we associate with health phenomena in the world. Um, for example, with the socio-ecological model um, advanced by, by social, uh, social epidemiologists. And uh, today we're gonna be um, sort of alternating between some higher level points um, and as we often do, uh, some models um, uh, that, that illustrate uh, these points. Um, and in order to motivate it a little bit, I, I just want to um, uh, remind you of some of the, the nested structures that we often discuss uh, in the context of uh, sort of nested levels of context, um, context uh, that influences uh, our, our um, access to resources, our decision-making, our perceptions, et cetera, uh, across many areas of, of health um, and many other areas of life uh, as well. So um, I'm just going to, to switch to this. If I had been a little bit more artful, I would have incorporated this into the slides, um, but uh, better late than never and better Nate than lever, I always say. Um, okay. so. You know, in this um, common uh, construct of the socio-ecological level, um, we'll often recognize that while much attention within the health care system, or what unfortunately in many countries is a disease care system, lies uh, on a particular individual, um, they are nested and affected by relationships at a much broader uh, uh, set of levels. Um, and uh, we see, for example, those relationships outlined here as they relate to mental health issues. But beyond that, we have organizations in which they might be embedded, uh, perhaps this individual is a worker in a, in a tech company with a brutal schedule that doesn't allow time for, for, for family commitments and, and that organization ends up shaping mental health or perhaps uh, they're embedded um, in the context of a, um, an organization uh, that requires a lot of uh, physical labor, which leaves them too tired for caregiving responsibilities or to the things most important for them in life. And often, you know, uh, for children, these organizations might be schools, for example, um, schools, universities, et cetera. Um, communities uh, provide a context beyond that that often shapes um, shapes a, a person's ability to cope and access to resources, and of course, the relationships and organizations within it. And outside of that, we'll often um, you know, recognize impacts of, of policy, regional, uh, provincial, national, et cetera, and, and broader society and, and sort of societal norms and, and conflicts and, and ecological issues in society. So this particular model, happens to be related to mental health concerns um, from University of Michigan, as I recall. Um, but, uh, but it's emblematic of, of how researchers have used this construct of a socio-ecological theory to put individuals in a nested series of contexts. And in many ways, today's lecture is motivated by, informed by, and works to operationalize some ways in which we might capture these levels of constructs in this very flexible technique uh, of agent-based model. Um, 
So uh, with this model in mind, I'd actually like to acquaint you with some more particulars, uh, particulars associated with specific models. And to do that, we're going to fire up our any logics and we're going to download some of the, the models which are up on the, the course site. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll switch to the slides, which will give us some, some guidance uh, for those models uh, here. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll go through a couple in quick succession and then return back to them. The first is one we've seen before, several of these we've seen before, and it's the hierarchical infection transmission model, which um, is often built in my boot camps. Um, it's one that we discussed in the context of spatial context and mobility among contexts. But we're going to, to talk about it now as indicative of kind of multi-level or multi-scale modeling. Um, so uh, we're going to go uh, open that up. It's the hierarchical infection transmission version nine, and you can find it up on the Canvas site for the course um, uh, here uh, about halfway down the list of models. Okay. Um, now, if we uh, open that one up, and I, I thought I had it open here, but it looks like I didn't. So I'll join you in, in downloading it here. What we're going to see is um, a context in which we have people um, and the people are in populations, but those populations themselves are in cities. And uh, people are connected with each other in networks, but cities are likewise connected, in this case, in transportation networks. And each person is going to evolve according to some theory as captured by an all too familiar state chart here, susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered. And the colors are indicative of, of um, the coloration we'll use uh, for individuals in each of those states visually to sort of clue us in to, to what those colors are. It's a sort of a legend of sorts. Um, and people here are going to spread infection um, whilst in the infectious or infective state. And they'll be exposed to infection and with a certain probability, uh, a transmission probability given a discord and contact, the contact between a susceptible, someone who was here, and an infected who contacted them, they'll proceed to the exposed state, being latently infected. And after some period of time, they complete their latency, become infective, expose others, and then after some period of time, recover and then lose immunity. But really, that isn't. That isn't per se the focus. I, I do want you to note that this state chart is a very familiar one. Um, it's a fairly um, um, simple, almost mechanical model of sort of the stages someone can go through here. Um, there's not a lot of emergence going on at the individual level. This is a point I'm going to come back to right now. However, these individuals are located uh, not just in an overall environment, but in a particular city in that environment. And that city, in turn, uh, has dynamics associated with us, including interventions it can undertake. It has processes operating at this level, and has this population of people. And these cities are themselves located in the main environment. So if we we go run this model and I'll run the, the baseline, let's say. Um, and uh, our goal here will be just to illustrate um, processes occurring at several different levels. Uh, we'll have, oh, have a heap space is exhausted. Okay, well, ain't that something. Um, why that only came up now and, and baffles me, but I will, uh, I will go set this. If I select baseline, view it in the properties, I'll select the maximum available memory to be 1,024 megabytes. So that's one gigabyte of memory, and I will run this. Um, so we have uh, 
five cities here, count them, and uh, we're going to have people placed in these cities who will be wired into networks. Um, and these individuals will be situated um, in contact with each other in a way that allows uh, infection to spread from one person to the next. Um, and uh, here we're going to, and this is taking an awfully long time. Um, not not sure what's uh, what's up with this. Um, this is uh, un unusual. I'm wondering if my computer as a whole is running low in memory or something, but um, I'm gonna run it with a somewhat smaller amount of money, uh, memory, in fact. Okay, so we put these people into these networks, um, which should be illustrated. And it is taking an awfully long time for what was to be a quick demonstration. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, so these people are placed in networks. Um, uh, a given person who starts infective, for example, can end up transmitting within a network and then could uh, move between uh, different environments here in ways that um, uh, can spread the infection to other cities. So this is the basic idea that we have dynamics going on here at the level of an individual. We have them progressing in terms of their infection status. Um, but we also have uh, infection spreading at a city level. And spreading at a city level, um, we could have statistics at a city level describing the dynamics there. Interventions happen at a city level, triggered in this case by um, uh, by uh, some measure of prevalence, et cetera. Beyond this, uh, we have uh, individuals moving between cities in a way that can infect uh, multiple cities. And we could have statistics at, a, at the overall level, the number of cities that are infected, the overall prevalence, et cetera. In short, what we have here is uh, infection spread um, that induces emergent patterns at the city level and at the overall level as well. And those emergent patterns can be seen at these, these several levels um, above the level of an individual. So this is an example of a multi-level model um, here. And uh, as a multi-level model, it um, uh, it fits into this general rubric as one of these types of multi-scale models. We have dynamics going on at multiple scales. Dynamics going on at the person level, but emergent dynamics really occurring at the city and overall level in ways that, that induce patterns that weren't pre-programmed. Okay, so, so this is um, one model I wanted us to look at. We'll return to it. But before that, I wanted to look at uh, another model um, as well. Uh, and specifically, it's a model called multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects unlocking. Okay, so we're gonna go download that as well. Um, and once again, you can find that in the list of models on the website, but it's the second, second one listed this multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects unlocking. Now, this model uh, will also be a multi-level model, but the relationship between the levels is not purely one of nesting. Um, there is transient nesting that occurs. There's a person and a care center, but people affiliate with care centers based on their home location. Um, and thereafter, their they're um, addressed, their needs are addressed by that care, uh, that care center. So I'm going to open that up, multi-clinic SIS hybrid. And uh, here we're going to have a person. Uh, they have an infection state chart, but they also have a state chart. Remember, you have state charts for different concerns. One is for infection. One is for care seeking. They're situation with respect to 
their current status for care. Are they seeking care? Are they in transit to care? Are they actually under, under care? Excuse me, the top one is not seeking care, not seeking care. And at an individual level, we'll count some types of information, the count of times they're infected or the count of times they've gone and sought care. Those are a little bit more complicated. They, they result from an interaction of these state charts. So you could be excused for saying that those will exhibit emergent behavior. It's not from this state chart alone or that one. Unlike the previous model where we had one state chart um, and they have some diversity in them beyond their, their home location. They have an income and sex. Okay, um, but beyond this, um, we have people in homes. This is kind of a kind of a, a place that they can be with, with a set of other people. And we have a clinic. And there's a language associated with this. We'll be talking about later in class a bit, discrete event simulation workflows. But the basic deal is we're going to have a representation of the operation of a clinic, the service delivery in a clinic using a language that's well matched to that. Um, it's, it's also a language um, that's going on at an individual level and it's capturing the flow of agents um, in different ways through this uh, service delivery system. And that language affords us a really uh, rich way and expressive way of asking questions involving resources, and outcomes like the time people spend waiting or how long it took them to go from end to end or the throughput, the number of people that could be treated per day or the utilization of certain resources like healthcare workers. So it makes a distinction between um, people flowing through the system, the so-called entities and the resources that mediate and um, allow that flow to happen. Uh, in this case, healthcare workers, but it could in general be equipment, you know, think x-ray machines or think uh, an ultrasound imager or think an EC EKG machine or whatever, um, and, uh, and uh, fixed rooms even, et cetera. So we have, we have resources governing movement through here. And here we can get emergent properties. We can get queues building up. That's what this little thing that looks like the beginning of a ladder over here or a distended D. Um, it's actually the beginning of a, a, indicating a queue extending to the left. Um, there can be queues that build up because we have an imbalance between people waiting and, and people you know, delivering care to them. Um, people can leave if the waiting time gets too long. That's the, the kind of um, link over on the top. This is called discrete event simulation and people interested can, can pull up dozens of videos where I teach about the integration of this with classic agent-based modeling. But our point here is that beyond the bits of emergent dynamics going on at an individual level, like recording the count of times or infected and presentations, from, from some combination of these state charts, we also have some emergence going on at the clinic level. And in fact, because treatment in this clinic is required to lead to um, either, to, it's required to um, treat someone and cure them from their infection. This is treatment mediated recovery that's posited. They have to be successfully treated. They have to be in this line, not leave, wait all the way through it and be treated in order to recover from this illness. If we go back and we look a little bit closer, we might've thought this was the same basic pictures we saw in the last model, other than not having a, a uh, recovered state, but it's, it's more subtle than that. Individuals here stay infective until they are treated. This is treat, treatment me, mediated infection that we, we posit, we need to treat them until they recover. That's not quite true for say gonorrhea and chlamydia. There's a fair bit of natural recovery goes on, but a lot of cases of gonorrhea, um, in some cases of chlamydia can drag on for months and months and months or longer causing great harm, risk of ectopic pregnancy, for example, 
um, if, um, if individuals are left untreated. So for quite a few situations, treatment is very important um, and potentially for some required to recover. And so individuals here need treatment and it'll go back to susceptible. And if you look closely, what you'll find is those who remember um, our discussion of message-based transitions, there's a message that needs to be received for them to head on this transition. The message is that they are cured, that thou art cured by, and we go in the clinic and we see that if they are successful, we tell them you're cured of your illness. Um, and uh, you know, you uh, you can you can go home now cured. Individuals don't know if they're cured, and there's a certain chance, probability of treatment success, they will be cured, and a certain chance they won't be and not know it, and potentially go back and circulate sexually, for example, with others thinking that they no longer have gonorrhea or for me. Um okay. Um, so uh, here we have a, a rather complex type of dynamics that can occur at the level of, of the clinic, but whether or not someone is cured will indicate whether or not they stay within this state here and can expose others to infection on an ongoing basis. In short, it'll end up affecting whether the infection spreads. So if the clinic is too full to treat people, it will it will have a big line. People will leave without being seen. They'll balk. They'll say, "I'm out of here." You know, um, I'm, I'm waiting too long, and they'll go back and spread the infection to more people. If the clinic is able to serve people quickly enough, they will recover quicker, and and through that, they will return to a susceptible state and they won't spread it anymore. So the clinic's dynamics are tied up with, although so that they're coupled with, but they're somewhat independent of the overall dynamics. So we have dynamics, we have emergent dynamics here to a degree at three levels, kind of at a minor level, emergent factors at an individual level uh, coming from multiple state charts. We have dynamics going on at the clinic level involving backing up and people's treatment. And then we have dynamics at the overall level. So let's go, let's go look at a baseline here if we could. Um, and um, we'll see if, if um, my computer is too low in memory to, to cause, um, to allow me to do this. Okay, so we start with a single infective a uh, small number of infected, three infected, oh, sorry, three exposed individuals shown in, in yellow here. Uh, individuals um, may be co-living with, with other individuals. I uh, see there's a fourth up there, in fact. And in fact, if we, if we dip down into this population, we can see most people are not seeking care and remain susceptible. If we go up uh, instead to the the higher level and look at homes, for example, we'll find that some homes have several people. For example, person three or person 66. <laughs> this is one crowded home, I'll tell you that. Um, uh, okay, home one. Um, okay, um, and, and each of them has uh, some number of connections. Wow, this <laughs> that is one heck of a home. It's more like a congregate living location. Okay, um, so we have people in homes, and we have one clinic uh, in, the, uh, in the town. And some of these people have now turned infectious, and they can start to spread infection. And so the, the illness count, the count of infective people is rising here, ominously. Um, and, uh, and these individuals are circulating with others in their home spreading infection, and I'm going to turn it up. And we see the infection count as people sort of recover, um, uh, changing here. Um, and this is, I believe, the fraction of the population. This is new infectives, I think, and this is fraction of the population that's infective. And we can see it start to spread here. Now, let's go to the clinic because a lot of dynamics are occurring at the level of the clinic. This clinic has treated 
about 400 people so far. No one's, uh, very few people have balked yet. I think, um, uh, yeah, very, uh, very few have gone out um, through that status. And uh, 37 of, or 40, 43 have now exhibited treatment failure, but a much larger number have been successfully treated. The healthcare workers here are 33% utilized, 34%, but the number is rising here. The number is rising potentially ominously. Let's, let's go back to the population level. So this is the dynamics here. We seem to be in okay shape. We're, we've got flow through the system okay. We're getting treatment success for most people. Right now, that's not tied in with the busyness, although we could make it. We're going to go up one level here. Um, and we're going to speed up um, the infection more. And here are the count of illnesses. And, and now we start to see it rising. And, and okay, now, now we're going back to the clinic. And okay, we're getting stressed. And now... Wow, wow, the number, there's quite a few people leaving without being seen. Um, uh, and in fact, far more of them have left without being seen that have been treated so far. So this number who are leaving without being seen because they're waiting too long, they're saying, I'm, I'm out of here. They actually are dwarfing the number that have been treated successfully. About 20,000 for the latter, 470 or something thousand there. The healthcare workers are really stressed. They're really stressed um, and, and stretched to the limit to keep up with treating people. And that's even with most people leaving. And of course, those people leave can spread the infection, right? They're, they're spreading it to the rest of, of their community. And it doesn't look good. Um, the situation is not encouraging. I would say code red. Um, and, and we see, you know, a very high prevalence of infection here, um, uh, upwards of 85%. And this is the count of times people have been infected. Um, uh, and so we're getting, we're getting a very adverse situation where the clinic um, is just not able to keep up and the infection has gone crazy. Now we could add clinics. Let's go add a clinic here. And I just added a new clinic right there, clinic two. And you can see, okay, um, okay, that's uh, that's that's uh, interesting. Um, uh, I'm not sure uh, quite what happened there. The illness count dropped. We were able to to treat people more quickly. Um, uh, so we have two clinics now: clinic zero and clinic. One, um, both of them are pretty maxed out here. Um, and let's go go up here, and we can see that the prevalence of infection is still horrendously high. Ah, I have a theory about why it jumped up. Okay. Um, uh, well, no, okay, that wouldn't account for it. Okay, I was thinking by recovering, they become infectious, and therefore they get reinfected very quickly. Um, but that wouldn't that wouldn't explain why um, there's so many more who are currently infected. I'm going to add another clinic. This is three clinics now, and notice the illness counts per unit time have come down, um, but we still are getting. We transiently lowered it, and then it shot up again. Okay, um, three clinics, four clinics. Here we go. Um, so. What we are seeing is clinic dynamics, the emergent patterns at the clinic, coupled with the overall system, right? Um, the system is driving patients to the clinic, driving the wait times to the clinic as emergent feature based on the number of healthcare workers, driving how many actually leave and you know, being cured. Uh, and, and that in turn is feeding back to the overall dynamic. So we have these multi-level dynamics, levels at the person level, some basic emergence at the clinic level here, and then at the, the overall level. But we're still in a pickle, right? I mean, we're, we're still dealing with very, very high levels of, of, um, of infection. I'm gonna add another clinic. I'm gonna add five clinics. 
Okay, we have five clinics circulating in population. Okay, now maybe we've made some progress here, but we're still getting, uh, uh, looks like a lot of people infected. Let's go back to the clinics here, 94% busy, 99%, 99%, 90, or, oh, I saw one in the 80s, I think, 85%, okay. Okay, okay, well, let's try six. Maybe six is the charm. Um, uh, well, hey, we did bring it down, it looks like, to 90%, the prevalence here. And now it looks like it might actually go below 90%. We brought down the number of new illnesses per unit time, it looks like. Looks like we've cracked 90%. Now, that's, a, that, that's not a, a grand measure of success. Um, and it is going down. The prevalence is slowly declining, it looks like, uh, which is encouraging, but it's still in the 80s, right? Um, if we speed it up more, um, and- uh, I, Sorry to interrupt, Professor, but uh, yeah. uh, one of the, ch the upper chart is mislabeled. That's actually mean healthcare worker utilization. This one here? This This one? Sorry, the middle one, the upper line chart. Oh, this one here, mean healthcare worker utilization. This guy. Okay. Okay. That's super helpful. Okay. This is utilization levels. Okay. So it's a measure of how busy the healthcare workers are, what fraction of the time they're busy. Whereas this is a measure of, of new infections, I think. And we don't have a current infection prevalence. This one, it's the number of times people have been infected, I think. Um, uh, Okay, so uh, six clinics. Well, we seem to have lowered the situation slowly. Let's try seven. Um, here we go, seven clinics. And okay, um, we are bringing it down into the 70s. Uh, and it's looking hopeful it's dropping into now down about, 75. Okay. I'm going to add eight clinics. Okay. There we go. Okay. We've broken the back of it. Okay. It's going down. It's been, a, we're, we, we've reached some sort of tipping point. We're in a virtuous cycle where we, you know, we're able to keep up. Um, the crowds are less in each clinic. We're able to treat people quicker. We, we successfully treat a larger fraction of people. They go back cured. There and uh, as a result, um, there are fewer people circulating in population or infective, and we've gone into a situation where fewer people need to come to our clinic. And so we're we're in this virtuous cycle, and we can see we're in a race to the bottom in a good sense in terms of utilization. And look look what our illness count has done. Man, um, utilization is a little bit. It's averaged over time. Our illness count has basically gone to zero. Okay, so, and it's reflected in the fact it's all, it's situation green. Okay, well, that took a lot of clinics, right? Um, if we had gone and, and run this, and I'll, I'll do it in, in, in quick order here, I'm going to add it up to with Wade's uh, characterization, if we get up to about six or seven clinics, we're right at the edge of extinction. And then boom, uh, make it extinct. Okay, um, so we've got these multi-level dynamics. I wanna, I wanna teach one principle here. Um, I'm going to start it with three clinics. Start it with one, three clinics. Here, we started off with one. It got out of control. We were fighting it and we found add one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, six, we got at the brink of extinction and eventually it would go extinct. Let's try starting it, let's say with, with, with three clinics, okay? Um, so I'm gonna start it with a count of clinics equal to three. Let's suppose we start it off with that from the get-go. Um, so here we go. So we're, we're starting, we have uh, this set of people here who are initially exposed and we're going to uh, start running it uh, and they turn infective and they're able to 
start spreading, but some of them presenting for care at the clinic. You notice that. Um, and if we go look at utilization, you know, the, the healthcare workers are just waiting for, for people for to be ill. Um, and the count of new illnesses is, is, is basically down around one to three or so. Um, and in fact, now it's gone down to zero. Um, but well, okay, at any one time, then someone becomes infective having been in a in a exposed state. But we're at risk of extinction uh, very quickly because of this. And if we if we run this out, um, we may find it goes extinct before it really gets started. This is a phenomenon. This, this comparison is illustrating a phenomenon called lock-in. So you can be in a situation commonly within complex systems. Think about this, uh, for example, where you, you have a, a situation and if you don't intervene, it gets into a point where correcting it takes much, much, much more in the realm of resources than heading it off. All it took was three clinics. We were able to head it off at the start. It took six or seven clinics to remediate it after the fact, to pick up the bag after the infection had started to spread. Let's try it with two clinics, just two stinking clinics, folks. Two clinics. We're gonna we're gonna start it with, um, and well, with this extra resource, not just the one we had originally, but those two, we will let it start up. And we can see again, you know, it, it sort of peters around at, at, a, at a smaller level, but it's being contained. It's not taking off. And then lo and behold, it goes extinct. Two clinics compared to six or seven clinics. A stitch in time saves nine. And of course, similar principles can be articulated for many types of infectious diseases, but many others as well. Chronic diseases, um, matters like um, obesity or, or, or issues having to do with, um, you know, with obesity and norm setting, for example, that may get into a locked-in status, something I know is Marcelin's uh, interest. Um, uh, you can also get these phenomena, for example, with uh, addictions, drugs, right, where, where someone becoming addicted, almost by definition, it's much harder to break out of it than it was to head it off in the first place. Um, there can be cycles of violence, et cetera, uh, that, that get into these issues. And I would add mental health concerns. Breaking out of it takes much more effort than, than heading it off. Um, okay, um, so this was kind of a um, a detour with the with the um, principle of lock-in, but I really wanted people to be exposed to that. But I want to come back to this point that this model exhibited emergent behavior at several levels. So we saw it a little bit at an individual level. I'll I'll, I'll start up that original scenario again. Um, uh, at an individual level here, and also dynamics at the level of a clinic. So I'm just going to just speed this up, start things cooking here. And here we have uh, infection spreading. There's some, some ups and downs initially, uh, but eventually it catches and goes ba-boom. Um, and if we go look at this at the level of uh, an individual, for example, this individual. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I got a, I've got a, I've got a grant proposal to submit today. Um, 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 uh, she, she might consider it. I hope. Um, uh, so, so this is an individual who is well connected, 109 connections, but has been infected <laughs> five, five times and uh, presented for care 71 times, um, no less. Um, here we have another individual who um, um, has, <laughs> has a, is a person of more limited means. 
that's for sure. Um, and it's been six times infected and also in the 70s, waiting alongside her well-heeled uh, peer. Um, uh, and in others, you know, this person has been infected more times in kind of presentations, or it could go up to the clinic level, right? And, and view clinics and see the emergent patterns there, how many left through balking, in other words, leaving without being seen, how many left, um, uh, how many went out through this main pathway? How many were treated successfully? What's the healthcare utilization? These are emergent effects too. And we can go up to the overall level and go look at emergent effects there. Three different levels of emergent effects in this one model. And those, model, those, those levels matter. You know, the fact that we had this big backup at the clinic Many people leave, leaving without being seen. Some treatment failures really mattered in terms of the dynamics at an overall level too. It drove some of those people who left are gonna come back for care because they're, they're hurting, but they're also spreading it to others in ways that will affect this clinic and other clinics and the health of the overall population, right? So three different levels of, of um, of types of, of dynamics. Um, okay, I think um, I'll ask you to look at one more very uh, one more model uh, before we turn to to sort of reflect on this. And this model was um, one we also looked at earlier. It's called CTL state variable. That's cytotoxic T lymphocyte. Um, uh, oh, I don't. Oh gosh, I, I I don't see it. Um, okay, I'm uh, I will post it um, so folks can follow along here. Give me just a second. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is it there? Yeah, I think you're on lecture slides right now, not models. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, CTL. So I must have, I thought I was looking. Oh, here it is. Yeah. So I did post it just recently, I guess. Okay. It was one I, I posted in anticipation of today. Okay. Here we go. So we're going to load this in and we will. Uh, try opening it. This one is going to also exhibit multiple levels of emergence. We'll have emergence at a person level and emergence uh, at a population level. You may recall this one. This is actually like several of the others, a hybrid model, but we have, um, we have an articulation using stocks and flows, using differential equations. Um, an articulation of a model of immune function here. It's a simplistic model, it came out of work of Noack and May, I think. Uh, no, excuse me. Uh, yes, it was Noack and May, I think. Um, and they're both viral dynamics that, that uh, uh, inspired us to, to put, to create this sort of multi-level immunoepidemiological model. So within each person, we have immunology captured in terms of uh, dynamics of infection. So uh, free variants can build up um, uh, through exposure to others from neighbors in a network. So a person can get infected from others. Um, there's some viral clearance that goes on in, in, in endogenous viral um, production. But uh, fundamentally, what happens is these free variants lead to infection of cells. So that's what X and Y are. So they lead cells to get infected here. Um, and by virtue of those cells getting infected, they trigger um, eventual uh, spread to other uh, free variants. So in other words, the cells, the infected cells over time exhibit lysis and they release free variants. And that builds up the stock of free variants. So in short, a seed amount of variants coming from neighbors leads to a cascade of effects, which infects a lot of cells, which leads to more variants yet. And there's this vicious cycle which occurs here 
and leads to spread of virus within the body. Fortunately, that's not the only story. The other story, which we've all dealt with in our lives, is that the occurrence of infection triggers immune response. And the immune response, in turn, builds up um, some amount of effector cells. Um, there's precursor cells, which aren't modeled in, in this particular rendition of this model. We have much more sophisticated versions of this. But um, these are um, cytotoxic T lymphocytes here that are represented, which end up killing off the infected cells. That's what this death by CTLs are. Um, it kills off the infected cells, and by virtue of that, helps stem, helps stop the production of free viruses uh, when these cells die um, and undergo lysis. So we have a, a balancing loop here, which tries, as the number of infected cells goes up, it prompts the immune system to build up and then to, to kill off those infected cells. So there's this reinforcing loop and a balancing loop. And those induce behavior at a level of an individual that is uh, emergent. Now, um, in the context of that emergent behavior, if that level of infection ever goes above a certain level, if the level of free variance goes above some fatal viral level threshold, this person will die, okay? And people will differ based on their immune status. So age, whether someone's taking immunosuppressants, um, uh, other aspects of their health status um, uh, can end up affecting immunological parameters. For example, um, this uh, ability for people to quickly marshal uh, an immune response. This, this uh, parameter C reflects uh, some aspects of how quickly they can marshal an immune response. Um, uh, beta also relates to how quickly the infection can spread in their body, et cetera. And drugs might also affect some aspects of it. For example, limiting the, uh, the free variants and their ability to, uh, to infect cells or what have you. But, um, but fundamentally, people may differ. And you may get people with impaired immune status, for example, of a low C, and therefore their immune system doesn't react as quickly. Um, if a person's viral load goes too high, if the emergent viral load goes too high, they die, and this agent will be removed. Um, so by going to the dead state, the agent is removed, okay? Um, in emergent dynamics at the level of person. But as I alluded to, people are not solitudes. People receive free variants from their neighbors. And what neighbors are they? They are neighbors in a network. And these people are placed in a network. So I'm going to run it with a high viral load threshold. In other words, a, a threshold that it, it's going to take a lot of virus to, to kill off a person. Okay. Um, we're going to switch here, and people are going to be in networks. And each of these people is a each of these nodes is a represents a person. And we're illustrating in a rather evocative way. Um, using red to indicate the viral load level and the width of these circles to indicate the strength of their immune response. You'll notice over time, these circles are shrinking um, after they've fought off the virus, the immune system remembers that it's, this, it's represented as having this stock of CTL, cytotoxic T lymphocytes. These immune, crudely uh, here, you might think of them as as sort of uh, elements of immune memory, this immune complement, which has been built up and then it dies down. But it's protecting that person from further infection during that time. It's all ready to go. It's like an army that's been mobilized, ready to fight. And then over time, it dies down. Perhaps there's competition from other infections that need protection from, and those CTL T lymphocytes die off and, and others replace them for other conditions or what have you. Other pathogens, uh, mycobacteria or, 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 or other types of, of viruses or what have you. So here, 
you can see the dynamics at an individual level sort of animated here, but it's spreading in these networks. It's spreading from person to person in the network. So there's a spread through the network. And I don't think I, if, if I had been again more artful, I would have prepared more visuals, but down here, you can see the viral load across the population, uh, accumulated population-wide viral load, uh, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and this is, uh, this is a model exhibiting behavior, immersion behavior in an individual. That's that whole immune functioning. And then immersion behavior at the population level. Yes, or uh, Sorry, can you show again what that, uh, what that uh, stock and flow model on this top level was? Oh, uh, the stock and flow model was just accumulating um, the uh, population-wide viral load. So, so here uh, it was taking the viral load from all people in the population and accumulating it up. That's what this thing okay. is. So it's this is the mean viral load, I think, across the population. And it just totaled it up across the population. And this stock, because it has a single flow into it, it just serves to total it up. It's just summing it up, I mean, integrating up. Yeah. Is that just an easier way rather than summing it up over the whole population? Yeah, it was, it was just a visual way to do it. Okay. And, yeah. and uh, uh, I, I, it's a it's a nice visual way to indicate this is the sum of that over time. Yeah. Um, but you can see this actually evolves uh, in a sort of emergent property towards a sort of equilibrium at the overall level. Um, and you know, there's a corresponding equilibrium at an individual level where you see people have you know, this protection level uh, built up, this level of immune protection. Um, and many of them have some virus still present, but they have this immune protection within this area. Of course, the infection didn't spread to this area to the right here. So this is this is with a high viral load threshold. I don't think anyone died here. Let's go look at it with a medium viral load threshold. And here we're going to get. I should have illustrated here. I'm I'm sorry. I um, uh, here we should have said people, um, they have their level of sort of immune responsiveness C drawn from a distribution. So some people have stronger immune responses. Um, some people have weaker immune responses. Diet can affect this. Uh, presence of chronic disease can affect this. Um, age, as I said, um, immunosuppressant drugs. You notice here, some people have died actually that some of the network disappeared. Um, and, and those people uh, who passed away are, are no longer contributed to the, uh, to the population and, and are no longer uh, able to obviously spread the, the infection. Um, so here we have individuals who might have weaker immune systems um, be subject to, to passing. Um, and uh, and we can see actually a rather different dynamics uh, eked out um, from this uh, result of this um, uh, different viral load threshold. Um, okay. Um, yes. A B. Um, so beta or B B here. B. Um, so we can go take a look at B. I'm um, trying to remember the role it played. Okay, so down here. Oh yeah, this is uh, how quickly the um, how quickly the the um, uh, these uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, these these uh, immune cells that kill off. Um, kill off infected cells, how long, how quickly they turn over, how long they stick around, um, over what period of time do they, um, uh, do they die off? If B is higher, they die off more quickly. This is the rate of decay of them. Um, so the hazard rate by which they die, the chance per unit time they'll die, okay? They'll disappear. And it's, it's what? Cheated. 
It's a killer. Well, I wouldn't say this is generally a natural process, um, uh, but there might be, uh, I'm, I'm not an immunologist and I don't know what factors affect this, but I think there will be some variability between people often in terms of immune turnover of the immune complement, how quickly it dies off. And some people might vary in, uh, in how long their immune memory stays around. I know, for example, for COVID, kids and elderly, um, data I've seen uh, and, and data I've heard about from several sources suggests that there's quicker loss of immunity by elderly and, and children for COVID than folks in their more broadly between those age bands. Um, so, you know, this, this could reflect um, differences in duration of the immune memory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the simpler way might be C is how fast the circle gets big and B is how fast the circle gets small. Uh, yeah, this is how, how quickly that circle will shrink for sure mm -hmm. um, or relates directly to that proportionally. This, um, the one C is, yeah, how, how it's the growth rate that is achieved as the circle grows, how quickly exponentially it can grow in response to a given level of 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 uh, of y of, of these infected cells. Yeah. yeah. So substantive dynamics at an individual level, stocks and flows, and sort of some discrete reasoning associated with state charts induce dynamics at an overall level, two levels of dynamics. Okay, so let's talk about what we've said, what, what we've we've seen. You know, um, so broadly, um, and I, I, sorry, I'm going way too out of, out of, um, uh, so often emergent behavior within external systems um, uh, exhibits, you know, quite some differences over different scales. And we often, it's very convenient to think about and then build models responsive to different levels of context. We started with that socioecological model as it related to mental health, for example, showing these nested levels of context. And what we've seen in our models here are levels of nested context, either, either nested context or relationally captured context. Like there was that one with the lock-in effects where people went to a clinic. They weren't nested in the clinic, but they were affiliated with that clinic. And, and by contrast, that first one, we start, started looking at the hierarchical infection transmission where we have people in cities. They were in the city, right? And they can move to another city. Okay, so here we have, you know, a large number of concerns uh, in the world where it's, it's, um, uh, undeniable that there's these levels of nested contexts and ABMs will often mirror that um, for, for reasons we'll get to. Um, uh, routinely, ABMs will have at least two levels of scale. I mean, they'll, they'll have an individual level within a population and then the overall level, but often they'll exhibit more than two levels. And several of these models that we've looked at have more than two levels. Um, um, not the last one, um, but for example, that one with clinics where there was emergence, a bit of emergent, or there was, you know, dynamics at the person level, and then there was uh, dynamics at the level of the clinic, and then there was dynamics at the overall level, for example, or the very first one with the cities and the, and the people, right? Um, so um, we can capture these nested scales through through nesting and, and networking in the model. Um, and these things mirror those in the world, right? Um, this is perhaps obvious at some level that, you know, people in that first model, if we went up and looked, you know, these people in our hierarchical model, they were placed in a city or to put it another way, cities in the model contain populations of people populations of person. That may sound, you know, um, so obvious as to be trite, but I want to contrast that to, for example, a, a stock and flow model or, or aggregate model, compartmental model, where, you know, if you want to have 
something representing different cities, you can have a bunch of compartments for city one, a bunch for city two, and, and, uh, and then one for the overall region, which refers to those cities, but they're not in any sense in that region. They're just side by side with regional level things and city level things and neighborhood level factors in it. Um, they're not, the, the nesting in the model doesn't mirror the nesting in the world. Um, the networking in the model doesn't mirror the networking in the world. Um, but uh, you know, often these models represent metapopulations, uh, situations where we have multiple populations and movements between them or spread between them. Um, we saw that in the very first model with the with the cities, right? Um, why would you do this? Well, th there's a number of reasons that models like this are recently popular. Um, I've listed some of them here. Um, sometimes the processes at each scale are essential for understanding dynamics um, of the broader system. So, so that model we looked at involving clinics and the lock-in effects, um, we really needed to, to reason about this impact of health service delays on how many people were getting cured, right? I mean, how many people were getting treated and how many of them were in fact getting cured and how many were leaving instead because they were waiting too long and that was a function of demand. That was a key part of what played out in the system. And, and that model was based on real world um, um, cases of overwhelmed STI clinics in the UK, actually, where um, uh, you know, researchers have noted that if people are kept waiting too long for treatment for an infectious condition, it can be, lead to a vicious cycle. A vicious cycle where more and more need treatment, it spreads more and more, clinics are even more overwhelmed, and they can't can't make progress, right? Um, uh, and you know this this general phenomenon where we need to capture these multiple levels is quite common. Um, you could argue that for long term care and schools, where we have screening processes or rules about staff sharing and long term care, for example, um, about visitors, um, you know. Uh, in order to reason about the illness of the residents, we need to reason about this context around them. Um, and we need to reason about the spread of infection in the broader population as it might lead visitors to be ill or the staff who are moving between different facilities to get ill or what have you. In school, similarly, we need to reason about you know, what's going on in the school, who's mixing with who and, and to what degree are kids coming from the surrounding community with this? So there's certain contexts where without representing this kind of intermediate level of focus, level of scale, you, you're gonna miss the boat. You're, you're not gonna be able to capture some of the key, key needs. Often we're interested in interventions at these scales, right? We're interested in setting staff sharing rules. Um, whether staff can be shared by long-term care facilities um, or only can work in one and not in the other, or you know, rules for visitors for long-term care or schools, uh, whether they're you know, only um, every other class meets together or you know, four out of the five days are at home or whatever it is. If we wanna simulate the interventions at that intermediate level, that one of those levels of context. We need to represent that context, right? Um, that level of, of nested context. Um, you know, often our interest is in capturing distinct mixing processes. So that first model, the, the models of hierarchical um, infections within populations um, and within cities, here, each city has mixing going on within it. Um, and uh, these uh, lead to close spread within that city, but only loose spread between cities as people move between cities. They migrate between cities. So here, there's this contrast between 
what's going on in each of these little bottles, these little compartments, you know, where you have mixing going on in city A and mixing going on in city B and city C. And then you have some migration or movement between them, um, maybe due to, you know, mass transit, maybe due to cars, maybe due to flights or what have you. And this is a very common need in infection depictions disease modeling. Um, and there's a whole class of models. Alexander Vespignani um, uh, has a whole class of these um, uh, diffusion, um, uh, diffusion and uh, kind of, um, I think maybe diffusion advection, but it's, it's uh, sort of local reactions and then diffusion between them more slowly that, that are very useful. Um, and there again, we need to represent these contexts. Or if we want to represent locality perception and decision making, you know, what's going on in a long term care may be the result of what they observe in that care facility. And so whether or not they are requiring, you know, um, uh, visitors to be tested or, or, you know, how frequently they're performing testing may be a reflection of their local context and capturing that fact can be useful. And, you know, sometimes we want to calibrate a model to multi-level data from the external world. There's this whole class of statistical models, some here will be familiar with, multi-level statistical modeling, hierarchical linear models as an example, that specialize in looking at multiple levels of context. Um, even mixed effects models, where we have um, random and fixed effects um, get at this level of multiple levels of concern, maybe variability between students and then certain shared parameters that hold across all students. Or maybe there's variability between students, but then there's some classroom level effects that are the same for all students in a given classroom, and then some for the same school, and then some for, you know, that are the same across all students, positive to be the same across all students. But this is very common in statistical models. And if we have data from the world generated by those statistical models, we can compare it with comparable statistical data from our simulation to develop confidence in our simulation. So, you know, we can produce synthetic data from our simulation, analyze it in the same way, compare it to data from the world. Or sometimes we're lucky enough to be able to use that data from the world on these different levels to directly plug in assumptions in our model. Um, okay, so we've seen the hierarchical infection um, transmission. And, and uh, I'll, I'll note that, you know, there's, there's something that I've alluded to at a couple points that is is easily missed here. Um, and I, I think it's not commented on much in the literature that I've seen, but I think it's an important point um, with respect to this issue of multi-scale models. I tend to use that term fairly tightly to refer to, um, and particularly uh, referring to emergence at multiple levels. And many models, um, do not exhibit emergent behavior really at an individual level. They have some very simple theory, like the very first one we saw um, uh, at, at an individual level. Um, and there may be emergence um, at higher levels, but not at an individual level. So let's go open up um, the SIR model. This is one of the first we started with for this class. And, and I'll, I'll invite you to open it up here. So if we go to help and we go to example models here and we go to uh, SIR agent-based networks here. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh. Um. Mumble. Um, I I think I I hit this cord. Um, okay. I'm, I'm, are are folks able to hear me still? Okay. Can anyone 
indicate yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's go to person here. So here we have um, susceptible, infected, and recovered. Really, there's not a lot of emergence going on directly here at the level of an individual. Again, it's almost a mechanical characterization of their, their situation. Um, uh, if we had looked at um, uh, the prisoner's dilemma model, which we, we saw before, um, that also, you know, had very simple rules about how the agent uh, evolved. It induced high-level patterns that are very rich. The number of surviving agents of a given type, um, and you can argue the energy associated with that agent had some emergence. Schelling's segregation model, where people's decision to move or not depended on the neighborhood around them. There's not at an individual level there much emergent behavior. Um, but some systems do have dynamics that are emergent at an individual level. And we saw this, right? We saw that CTL state variable with that, with those, you know, expanding those expanding circles and contracting circles, right? There was this dynamics that was emergent with respect to free variant levels and infected cells and immune system activation all tied up there in a way that led to these emergent patterns over time of how viral load evolved. And so at an individual level there, there's rich emergence going on. That's in contrast to something like the SIR model or prisoner's dilemma or shelling segregation where there isn't too much. Um, Again, prisoner's dilemma maybe could be argued about. Game of life would be another one. But it's really not much interesting emergence at an individual level. Um, I'm not showing it here, but I provide you separately sort of dynamics um, of body weight as it's affected by the surrounding environment, for example. Or we have other models of body weight and composition. Um, and you might link those to spread of norms and attitudes at, a, at an overall level, the level of the population. There's some dynamics at an individual level that's emergent and some dynamics at the higher level that's emergent. So if you have, oh yeah, we'll look at, a, look at an opioid model. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so um, I'll call this up. You folks won't be able to run it because although I did, Upload a, I uploaded a um, a zip form of it. You might, if you unzip it, you might be able to run. This is a by no means a stylized model, um, uh, but uh, what we see here is uh, sort of an accounting. This is one of our earliest models on on uh, opioids and narcotics, which has since been supplanted by. Um, more evidence-based yet models and, and more refined thinking um, based on discussions with a variety of experts. But we have a model of opioid use and, and um, abuse and, uh, and uh, health uh, and uh, criminal justice system consequences where you know, um, uh, some, some aspects of, of someone's correctional status are captured here. Um, uh, some aspects of, of the uh, uh, sort of the situation in terms of selling drugs illegally, the healthcare system, whether they're inpatient or or outside the healthcare system, uh, their status with respect to to use, whether they're a current user or a former user, and are they under treatment if a former user or, or not? Um, are they using prescribed opioids or street drugs if they are a user? Um, uh, this is based on stages of behavior change, I think often called the trans-theoretical model with maintenance, action, preparation, contemplation, and pre-contemplation. Um, uh, and uh, here we have um, uh, physiological state charts related to whether someone is overdosed or not. Um, and uh, importantly, because chronic pain uh, is a big driver for initiating prescribed opioids for sustained periods. We have a distinction between people who are in no pain, 
chronic pain or, or merely for a, a short time, but potentially severely postoperatively during that time after an operation. Um, and, uh, and finally, there's some distinctions as to whether someone's uh, 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 basically able to function normally, uh, what might be called a high function uh, level in life or is disordered, um, is, is dealing with a situation where their life is, is centered around where they're going to, to get their narcotics and, and you know, when they'll have a chance to use next, which unfortunately is a, is a reality for, for some individuals. Um, now, beyond this, and what I wanna draw attention to, beyond this interaction of, of these state charts, we have a stock and flow model involving building up of uh, uh, of tolerance with respect to the substance here, opioids. Um, the body builds up um, an ability to to tolerate uh, opioids, which means that to get a certain level of effect, a certain euphoric effect, you have to take more and more over time as your tolerance builds up. Your you know, to get the same same effect, you need more and more. Um, and that can come at cost to your liver and so on, but um, but it reflects, you know, ongoing use. And often it leads to escalation in terms of dose, a need for higher doses, higher doses, more frequent use, et cetera. And it wanes. It wanes based on time between uses. And this was a big issue during the pandemic. If people were only able to get opioids infrequently, their tolerance would wane. And then they take the same amount of opioid thinking that, well, that's, that's their normal use and it could kill them because their tolerance had waned. Um, but you know, that's the buildup of tolerance is reflective of the substance in the body, et cetera. And, tolerance ends up following their uses. So there's this theory associated with, um, uh, with uh, built up of tolerance. This was a particularly early sort of simple crude version of it. Um, but the, the basic picture here is there's dynamics within a person that is emergent in this model as well. And so we have built up of addiction and that craving for opioids that comes out of being without them um, and, and uh, having a, a high tolerance can lead to demand and attempts to get them, which can lead to unsafe behavior and interaction with dealers and uh, et cetera, um, and, and development of a disordered lifestyle. Um, nicotine um, also undergoes similar things. So when people are are, are starting to use nicotine products, whether vapors or um, are from uh, cigarettes, um, uh, they, they can develop you know, nicotine tolerance and uh, need more to get the same buzz and uh, end up, um, end up uh, addicted without, um, without intending to be. Uh, and you know, we could relate this to social network spread of e-cigarette use. So the point is, with a lot of conditions, um, there can be substantive individual level emergence going on, as well as emergence at higher levels. That's in contrast to these top models, where really, I would say the SAR model, there's not really emergence going on at an individual level. It's a kind of a mechanical model. The emergence goes on at higher levels for all the interacting agents. But within an agent, I wouldn't say there's much in the way of emergence to so the shell and segregation model. So these are two differences. Yeah. Uh, it is in Canvas. Yeah, um, it, it should be, yeah, unless I posted it in the wrong wrong place. So I'll, I'll go uh, point it out here. It's the opioid model uh, C2 under bar three. And I, I posted it as a zip because it includes some um, um, as a database component that records their their uses of opioids and maybe their purchasing transactions from from dealers, et cetera. Um, okay. Um, so you know we saw with the opioids model, and then um, I haven't looked at environmental contamination. I, we 
Let me, let me see. Uh, yeah, we, we actually have time to look at that. Let's, let's, let's go load environmental contamination hybrid. That's this one here. Um, it's, it's about, I don't know, a third of the way up maybe. Oh, um, uh, environmental contamination, maybe 40% of the way up from the bottom up there. Um, so this, this model, um, some may recall, some are likely to recall from boot camps, um, uh, depicts individuals in the context of different environments. And these different environments include homes, workplaces, um, in the community. And then, whoa, sorry, we have a community of people um, uh, that circulate between homes and workplaces at different times during the day. So each person here is in a simple state of being susceptible or shedding the virus or You're cutting, oh, I think we just got you back, but you're muted. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, I'll be. Um, uh, okay, um, we're in the closing minutes of class here, so I don't think I'll try to uh, reposition things for the ethernet cord, but uh, the cord beckons there uh, with the uh, promise of a more secure connection. Um, okay, so I was speaking here about um, this, this environmental contamination model. And in the environmental contamination models, we have people and uh, locations like workplaces and homes um, between which they circulate, those people circulate. Each person is either in a susceptible state or if infected, a shedding state, and they can become infected through the environment um, or uh, being an initial infective. And then after some period of time, they recover, in which case they're presumed to be immune. And we keep track of their time, whether off work or, or on work, to keep track of where they are. This is a meta population model, and people are circulating. So I'm, I'm going to run the simulation here, and we will see a key feature that I haven't highlighted yet. Uh, well, Okay, maybe it will do So we're, you're not sharing your screen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you. So workplaces here, as well as homes, are characterized by pathogen reservoirs. They're, they're characterized by reservoirs of pathogen that can build up uh, and decay over time. Uh, and they can decay through cleaning or potentially through natural processes. Um, Although I don't think we ex make explicit those different, um, those distinctions. Okay, um, so this is mean pathogen lifetime at workplaces and at homes. And we illustrate for workplaces with a little rectangle and similarly for homes, the level of pathogen that's built up there, um, the size of the pathogen reservoir, okay? So it'll be red, the redder it is, the more pathogen reservoir, the, the, the higher the level of the pathogen reservoir. Okay, so I'm gonna run uh, this small population here. So it's a little bit less visually crowded. And what we're going to see here is, oh, <laughs> that's a really small population. Okay, I'm gonna run medium population. Okay, uh, so this is leaving something to be desired. Uh, okay, let's let's try this. Um, there we go. Okay, that's it's a good match. Um, so initially we have people uh, ensconced in their homes. Everyone's green to indicate they're happy and and healthy. And then we have workplaces shown in these kind of factory-like settings and. It's all, you know, uh, they toot their horn in the morning and people all go to their workplaces, right? Um, and then at night they go back home where they're in a somewhat less 
orderly state, it looks like. They sleep on the roof of their uh, home. That's right. They sleep on the roof of their home because it's too hot. Um, and uh, back and forth they go. But you notice one of the homes has a high level pathogen here. And, and this workplace or, or home, I, I'm having trouble visually distinguishing which. I think it's maybe a home, is, um, is having a high level pathogenicity. And now you're starting to see pathogens develop at some other places. And you start to see some people actually who are infected as well. This home, for example, has, has one person infected. And now we see you know, a distressing number of people uh, infected. And we could go down to the level of particular workplace here. Let's go down to workplace. And we can see, for example, this, this workplace um, has you know, built up a high degree of, of, of pathogen um, from shedding that occurs. I didn't highlight this, but it's due to shedding into it from infected individuals. And it's building up um, uh, infections during the day. I'm oh, sorry, building up pathogen during the day and it's decaying. Um, and uh, broadly we see it you know, sp spreading there. And of course that drives um, exposure in the population and spread. And we have an adverse situation, but some people have started to recover. These gray ones um, have started to recover. Um, there's still some individuals infected, but um, most people are now recovered, but there's still pathogen circulating, right? Okay, um, so, um, uh, this is another model which exhibits um, dynamics at an intermediate scale, at the scale of homes, at the scale of, um, of workplaces. Um, we have really a very simple characterization at a person level, which doesn't by itself um, yeah, illustrate um, you know, much in the way of uh, of uh, uh, emergence. And then we have uh, uh, emergence going on at the home and, and, and um, workplace level and at the level of the overall population here. Um, so another model that's a multi-scale model. You have emergence taking place at different levels um, of this system. Um, not at the individual level so much, but at the home and at the uh, uh, workplace level on the one hand and at the higher overall level at the other. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's all we have time for today. Um, these um, multi-scale, multi-level and hierarchical models, um, very important tools for for good reasons. Um, uh, good motivations lie behind selecting these effects in ways that naturally mirror what we see in the world and having models that, that capture these features of the world so we can ask the right sort of questions about it so we can evidence the model, calibrate the model, characterize interventions in the model and characterize uh, key processes. Um, so that's all we have time for today. I uh, hope that's useful. Um, Thursday, we're going to be talking about stochastics in models um, and, um, and the role that stochastics play. Um, I will have to ask for um, people's uh, pardon today um, because of an extraordinarily um, tight uh, uh, and unforgiving deadline. Uh, I will have to uh, not hold office hours today, unfortunately. I would love to otherwise, but. Uh, Jay, uh, don't see, because uh, we don't have time for coffee. They don't see me. Oh, uh, well. Uh, You're once again muted. Professor, you're muted. Because the the internet is flaky here, and uh, because of a 
incredibly tight deadline. I'm, I'm not going to be able to hold office hours today, unfortunately. There's also something going on here, uh, some sort of bad burning smell that I, I need to investigate to make sure we're not going to see alarms. But something something strange is happening with uh, something burning. It, you folks can smell in the back, though, too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to investigate this. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, apologies for the, uh, the internet trouble, and we'll see you on Thursday with Stochastics. Take care there.